um, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the board policy board policy committee and. We're in this room versus upstairs where we normally have our committee meeting um, rooms, but I think we'll, we'll still have the sort of same practices down here, even though we're in the boardroom. Um, so it's less, less formal um, environment, uh, but just be in a different place. So um, I'm going to start with just introductions just at the dais. Um, and I'm gonna, well, actually, I'm going to start with Kara and then go to Liz. I'm Kara Bradshaw, executive assistant. Good afternoon, Liz Large, Contracted General Counsel. And Mary Kane, Senior Legal Counsel. Uh, Eddie Wong, Board Member, uh, Community Member. Michelle DePass, Board Member. Julia Brum Edwards, Board Member and uh, Policy Committee Chair. Herman Green, uh, Board Member and Community Advocate. Uh, Director Sullivan, do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Uh, Patty Sullivan, board member. And I have to leave right at 5:30, but I'll stay till then. Great. I'm glad you can you can join us. Um, and we should we should know that you're leaving to go to another school board responsibility. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you for um, being the board representative to the community budget review uh, committee, Director Sullivan. Um, so what we're going to do today is we have. Um, two uh, significant policies out for public comment. And as I noticed at the last uh, policy committee meeting and then also at the board meeting that we would take some expanded public comment, which we're going to do. And so uh, what we're, we're going to do is um, we're going to start with the um, junior reserve officers training and the military um, careers policy. And um, then and we'll have the public comment for that, and then we'll go to the public comment for district-wide advocacy and fundraising, um, and then we'll have uh, committee uh, committee discussion. And, uh, and I'll, I'll notice that for the district-wide advocacy and fundraising uh, portion, I do have an amendment to offer. It's been posted for two days with the rest of the materials. It's just to strike um, a sentence, and um, we can go from there. And then we also, then we'll have um, also an opportunity if anybody signed up, I don't know that there is, for um, another policy relating to um, diploma requirements. So uh, Ms. Bradshaw, do you want to call the first four? Um, yes, so we, we're starting with the JRTC policy. So yes. Okay. And I should, maybe before you start, I should, I want to also note that we've received a significant amount of comment on both, um, on both policies and for those that um, designated they wanted to be public comments, some of that has uh, been posted online, so that's available. Um, I think all the board members and committee members um, have reviewed it and will review it, um, anything subsequent, subsequent that comes in, but I just want to acknowledge the people who have spent the time to uh, submit written comment. Uh, Michael Sonnleitner, Sylvia Mangalu, India Wynn, and Michael Deschete. You, you can just um, hand it and they'll pass it down. I'll come up and then each go individually. I didn't bring um, our written public comment rules because we're generally more informal. You'll have uh, two minutes, and Ms. Bradshaw will let you know when your um, time is up. 
and uh, please start by just stating your name and um, any one of you can start. Um, could you give us like a 20 second warning at the end of the two minutes? There'll be a light here. It'll turn um, red and be right the little box right in front of you. At 20 seconds or so? Um, it's, yeah, it turns Take yellow you. at 30 or something like that. Yeah. I want to be respectful. Very good. I guess we can start. My name is Michael Sunlightner. Uh, you have my handout. GROTC is not compatible with CTE programs. I spent five hours putting that together, by the way, so I really hope that you read it carefully, uh, very carefully, since I cannot get through it in two minutes. Um, I'm a Fulbright Scholar. My, I'm an educator with over 40 years of classroom teaching experience. I've taught over 20,000 political science students at many colleges and universities, including many hundreds of high school dual enrolled students from PPS at PCC. I've, I've served on the Portland Community College Academic Standards and Policies Committee for 15 years before I became a trustee elected to the Portland Community College Board of Directors um, from 2015 to 2023. So that's my background. I do have expertise relating to CTE programs. First, <clears throat> briefly, JROTC is not career technical education. According to the Oregon Department of Education website, CTE programs use 21st century technology to support students in acquiring technical skills, professional practices, academic knowledge, and so on. None of these high wage, in demand career areas include drill, shooting practice, shooting competitions, or military training. GROTC is not even an academic subject. And unlike courses like math or foreign languages, GROTC credits are not counted towards entrance requirements for many state colleges and universities. Military science is not a science. In some states like California, GROTC grades are excluded when competing from computing grade point averages. And I've only gotten through the little bit. I'll go to the end and trust that you read carefully all of the arguments. Basically, there's a flexibility clause in every contract that might be made when one signs up at a recruiting station. They typically state how laws and regulations that govern military personnel may change without notice to me. The enrollee. Such changes may affect my status, pay, allowances, benefits, and responsibilities as a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, regardless of the provisions of this enlistment, re-enlistment doc document. In other words, even if you enlist, your promises for courses in the military itself that are CTE need not be fulfilled. You understand that? That's in the print. That's in the contract. And so, to say JROTC is not primarily about recruitment is dishonest. It was originally created under the National Defense Act of 1916 as a tool to recruit and train young people. You can see the last paragraph. I think, um, sorry. sorry. And the time is up? Is it time up? Did the, the initial one go first? I don't think I saw the initial one. It did. It did. So the yellow light came on, and that gives you about 30 seconds, and then the red light comes on, and that's what it's I'm sorry, I, missed, I let you go substantially over. I, did, um, I didn't see a yellow light. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either, so I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for providing this. We will read it, and we'll get it submitted for the record, too. Read carefully. I think you'll find it decisive. Okay. I also want to acknowledge that um, Director uh, Gary Hollins looks like has joined us, if that's the Gary. Yes, is that hello, the, hello. Okay, that is the Gary. I recognize the hello, hello. Uh, so I just want to recognize that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Eshtay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Edwards. I, I want to bring to, to light, I, I 
hadn't anticipated, and I'm speaking about this, but however, in my 26 years in the Marine Corps, I did a tour of duty on recruiting. They set me up for Camp Pendleton, and I was an active recruiter and a station commander for the Marine Corps at Beaverton and Salem. I was also a contracting officer for the United States Marine Corps at MEPS, Military Intelligence Processing Station, for six months. I signed the contracts that he's speaking about. There might be some truth in what the gentleman spoke about in the past, because I know there was a major revision in 1982 to the contracting forms to get rid of that and to come on something that any parent could read and go, I understand this. So perhaps I can't speak to the past, but I can speak to what it used to be. But I'm not here today to speak about um, the military because the JROTC element is not a recruiting element. I, I not once did I ever visit a JROTC element to recruit people for the military. That is not what it exists for. In fact, we receive instructions, leave the JROTC alone. Because the perspective is, if you violate the trust that a school has to install a JROTC program and people look at it and go, it's a recruiting mechanism, then you turn it off and it destroys the whole mechanism of creating citizens and providing opportunities for people to be volunteers in their community and one more level of success for students that are having a hard time, like me from 1978 in, in Northeast Portland at Adams High School. So I'm an alum, I understand that. I don't have to read the manuals on Marine Corps recruiting, I know it by heart because I was a contracting officer. If anybody ever wants to talk about that, I can. JROTC. With CTE skills, we have an MOS, a military specialty in the Marine Corps called 0311. It's an infantryman, and you can join to do that. And they have a job that's very serious. But like the, the young lady I spoke to, a sixth engineer at Swan Island this evening, who's at Oregon State, she's a reservist. She grew up in the Portland public school system, and she was talking. She wanted to be here in person, but she was talking about, if I'd have known this, I could have done this and this. She's going to college on the GI Bill. I'm talking about for the JROTC people that never joined the military. As a citizen, we're good. That's okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Sarah. Um, you cannot <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sylvia Magali. I'm a retired teacher from the Reynolds School District. Um, you cannot put a Band-Aid on JROTC to make it palatable. Once the district signs on the dotted line, you lose all local control. Um, as PPS staff member Chris Brita noted, no number of guardrails can control it. The military branch is required to follow U.S. code and DOD instructions. Um, and I have put that code and those instructions and links to them in the documents I've submitted. If you vote to authorize JROTC programs in Portland Public thinking that you can make them palatable, you are being naive or willfully ignorant. PPS students and the PPS community and your constituents expect more from you. And I know that you are capable of making fully informed decisions and not allowing yourselves to be bullied into this. JROTC is expensive. It costs the district money. It also discriminates. How can this board justify voting for a program that will not allow undocumented students? It will not allow students that the military deems to be physically unfit. How can this district include, sign on to a, a program that will not allow students who are struggling academically or behaviorally as determined by the military? This is your choice. Please make a fully informed decision. Guns do not belong on student, on school campuses. I can attest a junior ROTC student at Reynolds High School 10 years ago honed his marksmanship skills on our campus and then masterminded a shooting that killed two students and injured a teacher. Please vote no on JROTC. It is your responsibility. Thank you. Lynn Phillips, Erica Owens Taylor, and Taylor Waller.
Our public comment rules um, in this boardroom is that you hand them to um, board staff and they um, distribute them. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Director Green and PPS board members. My name is Flynn Phillips. I am a retired Navy Senior Chief Hospital Corpsman and a Fleet Marine Corpsman. I had a career of 20 years. I am here in support of the proposed Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps program for Portland. My story, I'm from Missouri. I come from humble beginnings. From a family of 10, I have two other brothers and seven sisters. My dad died when I was about 13 years old and we were immediately on welfare. I remember standing in line with my mother to get food for commodities back then something I will never forget and I have vowed never to be in that situation again. So ever since, I have been paying it forward. I joined the Navy during the Vietnam period. I was graduated. I was guaranteed a hospital A school for, me a school for medical, then on to Fleet Marine Medical Training, and after Vietnam, I went on to Cardiopulmonary Technology School, and then on to General Hospital Administration, serving as a senior enlisted member of the med medical department aboard USS America, an aircraft carrier. The Navy provided me with a career path and upper room mobility and as you can see, continued education. I came to Portland, used my GI Bill for education, and became a graduate of Concordia College and Hospital Administration. I became active in the American Legion, became my post adjutant, district finance officer, spent the last four years as a department adjutant, which is equivalent to a chief operating officer supporting 12,800 Legion veterans in the state. Why do I tell you this? It's up to you. It's, up, it's to you, the board members, and my brothers and sisters in arms, and the audience, including my naysayers, here have different opinions than I. I love them as well. The military is not for everyone. And as some of you vo voiced bad experiences with the military, and I'm sorry to hear that. But I stand before you to say, for those of us who chose the military as a career or stayed for just four years, we were all productive citizens of our city, city and community. It was a choice. It was an opportunity for me. I lead by example, and my family, my brother and sister, both joined the Navy. They did not make a career as I did, but interestingly, the three out of us ten were the most successful in life. My little sister went on to become a nurse practitioner, which I'm very proud. So I ask the board, I extend a hand to friendship, and thank you. Thank you. This works, right? Okay. Hi, my name is Erica. I am an Air Force veteran who served six years, and I'm here to explain in two minutes why we need to keep JRTC out of our schools. Our military doesn't exist for the purpose of defense. Its only purposes are to fill the ranks with fodder, ready to be sent to kill people and die, all for the goals of the elite class and imperialist motives. JRTC is the start of an insidious and predatory recruitment pipeline. JRTC programs and recruiters are often placed in areas with marginalized people who will have a harder time saying no to misguided promises from recruiters like financial stability. For BIPOC, queer, and gender non-conforming members who face vile harassment every day and can barely make ends meet, let alone think of surviving outside of the military, suicide seems like the only escape. Rates among military members and veterans climb, yet leadership remains indifferent. They know that changing things would mean dismantling the system itself. Survivors of suicide attempts and self-harm can face punishment, if selling, as if selling our bodies to the government wasn't enough. There is nothing honorable about grooming our children into joining the military under false promises of valor, honor, and financial security. There is nothing honorable about serving a country founded upon genocide of indigenous peoples, which hasn't ended, by the way. This country's military is a great evil in the world, and I experienced it firsthand during my enlistment. Our children have a right to autonomy and dignity. They are not numbers or bodies to be chewed up and spat out. They are sacred and must be protected, and we can protect them by keeping JRTC out of our schools. Thank you. My name is Taylor Wallow, and I've been an ELA teacher with PPS for four years. I'm here to oppose the JROTC and to call for the demands of the Oregon Educators for Palestine to be met. For years, I have attended board meetings where board members roll their eyes, laugh at public comments, and police the responses of attendees that have no other recourse for dissent. At the last meeting, one of you explicitly stated you don't care about our opinions. But with regard to the JROTC, if you will not listen to me, I urge you to listen to 
your uh, the vocal opposition of your fellow board members, Michelle DePass and Frankie Silverstein. In spite of your blatant disrespect, I'm here because my conscience will not let me rest without acting to protect vulnerable young people. Those who are in our care here in Portland, as well as the children of Gaza who are fighting for survival while they're brutally hit with bombs supplied by the U.S. military. So here are a select few arguments against the military recruiting program known as the JROTC. Protect program instructors are notorious for rampant sexual abuse. It diverts funds from public bu uh, school budgets, funds which could be used for other CTE programs that promote careers without high rates of death and suicide. It preys on vulnerable populations that are already systemically oppressed, such as BIPOC students and those living in poverty. It is a predatory tool of military propag propaganda and recruitment. According to Major General John R. Evans Jr. in an, in an interview, junior ROTC programs can be political footballs. The platforming of this program subjects students to an inaccurate portrayal of life in the military and robs them of their right to make an informed consent about what happens to their bodies. You present the programs as an optional elective, but in order for schools to receive partial federal funding, the JROTC program requires that 100 students or 10% of the student body be enrolled in the training corps. That means that students may unwillingly be enrolled. Opponents of the JROTC have been excused of pushing for a dogmatic system, uh, system of education. In response, I challenge you to find an institution that is more violently dogmatic than the U.S. military. Finally, I will point out the hypocrisy of the board's inaction during a genocide in the names of impartiality and the proposal to bring military recruitment centers into schools. PPS censors teachers who teach about the genocide of Palestinians your, your time is and up. then proposes the recruitment of students into that genocidal force. Your, Nothing your about that up. behavior please, please, is impartial. Please wrap up. No children are free until Palestinian children are free. Again, I do not expect you to listen to me, and I challenge you and implore you to prove me wrong. Do we have more public comment on this topic? Okay, so we're going to um, now have public comment on the second topic, and then, and then we'll go to any sort of d any discussion, like say I have an amendment to um, one of the measures. Serena Hollingsworth, uh, Maya Pueo von Gelder, Yaro Murphy, Katie Elizabeth Moss. I've never been in this room. <laughs> uh, my name is Serena Hollingsworth, uh, pronouns she, her. Three years ago, I received an email asking if people would like to volunteer for the Alameda Foundation. I said yes. It was a chance to help out the school and connect with the community. At the time, I didn't know that I was signing up to be a target of vitriol and hate. I didn't know that I was signing up to be called a racist by white women online. I didn't know I was signing up to be shamed for doing something that helps students in our district. I'm the daughter of a single mom who was a public elementary school teacher. I know hard times, and I'm very dedicated to public education. For years now, a loud minority has pushed an agenda and has silenced opposing opinions through bullying and shaming. But the majority of people I've met in this district aren't a part of this toxic echo chamber. The people I've encountered recognize that every dollar makes a difference. They recognize that the PPS reputation is damaged after a strike in budget cuts. They recognize that over 100 people will lose their jobs in a year because a small group is pushing a policy that tears some schools down instead of lifting all schools up. Those who drafted this policy have repeatedly said they don't care if the foundation schools lose their funding. But what about the schools without foundations that receive that 33% of funds that have been dismissed as pennies? Here's what those pennies are paying for this year. Arletta, an EA, Cesar Chavez, instructional coach, Clark, Matthew A, Creston, school secretary, Harrison Park, media assistant, Hayhurst, recess supervisor, James John, instructional coach, Jefferson, admin assistant for the Jefferson Dancers, Kelly, secretary, Peninsula, secretary and therapeutic intervention coach, Brigler, secretary, Rosa Parks, EA, Roseway Heights, math intervention, Vestal, Behavior Intervention Specialist, Whitman, Art Teacher, Woodmere, Bilingual EA. When all of these people get fired next June, are you going to tell them it's because you wanted to rip off the Band-Aid? This proposal is an abuse of power by an activist and a politician who will stop at nothing to win. If this proposal passes, do not expect the very people that you've ignored and insulted to engage. PPS students deserve better. Thank you. Good evening. 
evening. My name is Maya Pueyo Van Geldern. Are you asking for spelling this evening? No one's spelling. Okay. I'm here again to reinforce the need for foundation reform and express my gratitude to those of you who have worked toward this for years and are determined to see it through. We have an obligation to the children of PPS as a whole. This means expanding our values past our property lines to reach every child in this district. Right now, almost every school is facing district cuts. Every school in the district is facing cuts. So this is a hard time for every school community, but as things stand, only a select few are able to soften that blow. Many have to, are able to soften the blow by increments, not full positions, but it's just not okay. We don't give only certain schools the ability to fix a gap that is gaping when the rest of the school district has, does not have that ability. I know that it would be ideal to put forward a policy that is unanimous, has unanimous support, but taking big steps in order to remedy an in, inequitable policy sometimes means making a hard decision to just move forward. Can you imagine a world in which we waited for unanimous consensus to desegregate schools or address redlining? We simply need to change the norm. Next year and in the years to come, there will be new families entering PPS and they are completely unaware of past fundraising norms. Imagine what it will be like another seven years from now, so we've been at this for seven years, when all people know is that we work together as a greater community for the betterment of every single student in this district. When it's the norm to plan community events together, when it's more balanced, more collaborative, and equitable system, when that's the norm. Fantastic. That's what this district needs. After all the divisiveness that has happened over the last year, unity is exactly what we need. In an old book called The Book of Sands, it says, if you want your people to build a ship, you don't simply gather the people and assemble the wood, but you make them long for the edge of the sea. We need people to want to head to the sea, to do big things and create meaningful change, and I promise we will have hundreds and hundreds of families who we want to work together to build that ship, to collaboratively build, collaboratively build a better experience for all of our children. And we need this to happen in order to motivate them to do so. Thank you for your time and again for pushing this forward. Hi, my name is Yara Murphy, and there's some weird sound. Um, I don't know if it, I don't want to get feedback. Um, I am a parent at Buckman Elementary, and I'm here opposing the proposed fundraising policy. This policy is built on false assumptions that will likely harm struggling schools, the district, and the community. Local school foundations don't harm under-resourced schools. They bring vital resources to those schools. Eliminating them would not only create inequity, would only create more inequity. Instead of creating more equity, it would bring everyone down in order to make everyone equal. The policy would eliminate Buckman's parent raised funds by $40,000, and that would impact staffing and students at our school. 32% of the students at Buckman are underserved. The policy also assumes a thriving district-wide foundation envisioned within the next seven years. This does not exist. A better way in which to achieve this is working with local and district foundations as they complement each other. Local donors seek impact on a specific school or student, not a vague district-wide effort. While district-wide foundations can pursue large corporate donors and grants, and they could leverage each other um, and strengthen Portland's education system together. Quality education is crucial for our children's future and community well-being. Restricting parental involvement by mandating resource constraints could leave families like mine uh, to seek alternatives to PBS, decreasing enrollment and funding. We don't stand by as our daughter's education suffers. We will take her and the funding elsewhere. There are other options in the district um, or to leave the district, and this is happening. People are leaving the district. Furthermore, denying parental direct Parental and neighborhood involvement and contributions undermines community trust and involvement in public education. Thank you. I'm going to recall Katie Elizabeth Moss and also. 
also Gina Levine, Ellie Russell, and we have Jasmine Reese virtually offering her work. called okay okay great um i made a statement a couple of weeks ago and ran out of time this thing goes quick so i'll get right to the point the current foundation funding policy is inequitable and not serving pps students and schools that need it the most please vote to move forward with the advocacy fundraising policy change my kids assigned neighborhood school is a title one school when we lose staff the impact is devastating and we have no way of making money to hire additional full-time employees. When a district-wide foundation is put in place, we can work together to ask PPS families, alumni, Portland citizens, and even families who live outside of our state to contribute to a fund that would serve all PPS schools. Do not delay. Equitable fundraising practices are needed now. My kids' school is losing nine full-time staff members next year. Grassroots networks are organizing to demand the state of Oregon to properly fund education, and we need every voice to stand together. Together, we can do great things. And to the amazing and dedicated parents who have worked tirelessly to raise money through foundations or have donated money to foundations, please know that our plea for a fair system is not an attack on you. We're all on the same team. We're all parents who care about our kids and we want the best for our community. Let's work together when this new policy is in place and do great things for our kids because they all deserve it. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ellie Russell. My pronouns are she and her. I have students at Marysville Elementary and at Kellogg Middle School. And I would also like to start by saying thank you to all the parents who have contributed so much time and effort into their foundations and um, for um, sharing it out with the other schools. Um, but I would also like to dispel the myth that nobody is being hurt under the current foundation policy. While every dollar does count, some dollars are hurtful. When one school keeps hundreds of thousands of dollars while the others share the scraps, the message to the others is that their value is lower. Our whitest schools are benefiting the most from foundation funding, and white privilege is hurtful. At Marysville, a school that is 50% students of color, our staff reductions for next year add up to five FTE. We do not have a foundation to make up the difference. The amount we receive from the parent fund is laughable. The level of support our students need is barely covered by the unreliable Title I funds. A district-wide foundation will put the money where it's needed. Public schools, along with police, fire, and libraries, are a public service. If I donate money to, a public li to the public library, it goes to the entire Multnomah County Library system. I cannot donate to my favorite library branch. Portland Public Schools, however, continues to have a model where wealthy parents can fill the gaps to serve their own interests. This is inequitable. When I went to Salem earlier this year with other PPS parents, we united as one force, but it took leaders from many schools working together to make this advocacy happen. Imagine what we could accomplish if, if the fundraising energy currently spent at individual schools went towards one common goal. Take one last sentence and wrap up. Thank to you. increase state education funding for all schools. The time is now. Please do not delay any further. Thank you. Jasmine. Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Reese, she, her, and I'm a parent and volunteer at the K through five Bridal Mile Elementary in Southwest Portland. We're gonna go in the way back machine. In the summer of 2011, the North Williams Transit Corridor Project led by the city was underway and there was a point in the public engagement process where members of the Albina community took a 
demand and demanded they have a voice and say in the process regarding the improvements in their community. At the time, I witnessed many fierce raised voices, lots of tears shed, and the North Williams Traffic Safety Committee was expanded by 12 diverse voices, representatives of the Black community being impacted. These voices included myself from the Urban League YPs on North Russell and Michelle the Pass, a longtime community member and city employee. Ultimately, we were able to challenge the design consultant and redesign North Williams to what it looks like to today. Commissioner DePass, in a decade's time, you have grown from a community advocate shutting down and calling out public engagement processes when they were not inclusive to the impacted stakeholder community, to now being on the other side of the table as a decision maker who has an opportunity and responsibility to do the same in turn. Slow down to speed up on a process that has not been inclusive to local school foundation communities, students and households in regards to the direction of this future fund fundraising model. This policy revision process has polarized and demonized the fundraising process when it should have galvanized PPS households and private donors to organize and build a strategic political action committee to lobby Salem, position pro-public education candidates and challenge legislation Instead, this process has whipped up fear, projected anger, and turned neighbors against each other and caused households to tap out and leave the district. So sure, let's rip the Band-Aid off and listen to every stakeholder, including local school foundation leaders and their private donors, and how this fundraising policy should evolve in the next 12 months to an inclusive manner that lifts all voices and helps to close the achievement gaps in PPS at every school. I do not support this policy revision as it is drafted on the agenda today and a request for an independent subject matter expert to be engaged in partnership with the new superintendent to draft a final policy and action plan after a series of inclusive strategic stakeholder public engagement sessions. Thank you for your time. I yield. Thank you. Bradshaw, do we have more public comment? I could see your hands right now. Give me that topic. So, excuse me, it sounds like, looks like um, we had some students um, here to speak on the JROTC uh, policy. Is there one or two? How many are there? I'm sorry, were you on the list to speak? Are you, are you PPS students? Okay. Um, if it's okay with the committee, I think we should let them, let them speak. Okay, come, come forward. Um, so, just briefly, you didn't, weren't here when we started. You have um, two minutes to speak, and if you could start with um, your name. And um, I think that's all the rules you need to know. That the, There'll be a light, if you can see it, it's fairly brief. Um, it comes on when the, you have 30 seconds to go, and then a red light will come, come up, and we ask when the red light turn, um, turns on, just to finish your sentence um, and wrap up your time. Thank you. No, it is, um, how public comment works is um, we're here to listen to your concerns, and so um, we had some time at our regular board meeting, um, but a limited number of speakers, so today we're having an expanded number of speakers. So you just um, share your perspective or what, what you think we um, need to hear or what you want to share with us. Thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity, uh, members of the board. Um, my name is Daniel Lascano Villanova, and I'm uh, currently a senior at uh, Franklin High School, and I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm enlisting into the uh, Marines as of uh, June 17th, so I'll be uh, uh, leaving for boot camp in a, a month or two. Um, and I think my thoughts on this, this entire thing, is that the JOTC um, is... There are, there are lots of arguments, especially 
So um, I would say, especially with like all the budget cuts and all like the um, like the, the the strike, definitely because it's it's going it's going to be a problem with that. But I feel like um, when I was like told like my recruiter was yesterday was asking me like what was my experience with like the military I thought I, th I really I really liked it because I've gone in the past two years I've been in the uh, the late entry uh, the late entry program and I've met a lot of friends I I can call brothers now because of just like all the stuff that we go through all the hard work that we've gone through and it, it really helps and I feel like the JROTC would allow students to um, gain more knowledge, maybe perhaps about the, the military, because most people that I know, uh, you're like, oh, you're going to uh, join the military, right? And they ask me questions about it, and most people aren't, aren't well-versed about it. And I feel like um, the JROTC would be a good thing, but it could also hinder some things as well, like funding especially. Um, but, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, gentlemen that are here. Um, my name is Andrew Martinez. Uh, I graduated from two years ago. I went to Ida B. Wells. I am a teen parent from Portland Public Schools, so I had my kid at 15 years old. When I joined the Marine Corps, I was stuck in life. I did not know what I was going to do with myself or for my family. I knew I always wanted to do something to impress the, my family because I was always looked frowned upon from being a teen parent. I thought I would never be accepted in anywhere I was, and that's where I found that I was accepted, and I found that that bond of brothers that I would have never ever found out in the streets of Portland. The military has helped me now and my family and my parents, not only through the benefits that I was I have earned, but through just being in the military and having that respect from people who know and who acknowledge what we do. If I was in high school, if I was still in high school and would have had the opportunity to do something like this and would have had more knowledge of joining the military or in this instance um, JROTC I would have gone through with it because I, at that point I didn't know what I was going to do right I was lost I was I was worried about my family I was worried what I was going to become or what I could have not done for them and as of right now with being in the Marine Corps I am moving my family to San Diego we have our own house in San Diego California where I have checks that come in every two weeks. I can support them. I could be there for them. I could. My daughters don't have to ask me, Daddy, can you buy me this thing? When you get paid, I can buy it today and whenever they want. Therefore, I have became more of who I am through the Marines and throughout the brotherhood that I've made in the Marine Corps. And I know that I won't be just another person but someone to everybody in the Mercury, I'm important to them. So, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Kyle Zeming Liu. I was a graduate from McDaniel High School in 22. Um, I joined the Marine Corps to really better myself. I really wish that my school had a JROTC program, but the furthest school that actually had it, or the closest, was actually Clackamas. And I realized that the only thing that I could attend JROTC was only if I attended Clackamas. There's a lot of students out there who could really benefit from JROTC. Not everybody's going to like a CTE course or like the classes, but JROTC is different. It will really maintain a lot of leadership, show a lot of discipline, and really bring up the graduation rates of seniors in this school. Marine Corps has also given me a lot of opportunity. When I came back out, I thought I'd be lost. At first, after I graduated high school, I didn't even want to attend college, but now I'm attending PCC to become a commercial pilot in the aviation science program. And 
Throughout my time in the Corps, it really has taught me a lot. Now I can maintain my grades. Now I have a good financial work. Now I have a good job coming up from TSA. And it really has just been giving me a great opportunity, you know, in terms of retirement. I have a TSP saved up. You know, I never knew I would get a 401k. But here I am sitting right now talking about my 401k. <laughs> um, I'm also the first Marine in my family. You know, my cousin served in the Army during Iraq. But I really wanted to show you guys and talked about today. No. JROTC, I would really love it at McDaniel. It could really make a big difference in this community. It could bring a lot of students involved. During my time in the service, I was really shy and often frowned upon. But after a few weeks, I really grew up, really showed my leadership. Within a few weeks, I became second squad leader in my platoon during boot camp and throughout boot camp. I ended up making out of boot camp after six months, and what it really taught me was to never give up mentally. And I know that JROTC would prove a lot of that. So thank you for your time today, for letting me speak. Thank you. Thanks for everybody who came to testify today, and I want to thank our, our students and our alumni who showed up. We always appreciate hearing... Uh, student voice as well. Thank you. Okay, I um, want to open up um, the, the meeting now for um, committee members or the other board members who are here to, if you um, have comments or questions or anything, um, I say I have I'm going to add it at some point in time, but um, maybe we should start with the uh, JR OTC because I know um, Director Sullivan is going to be leaving. Um, so any comments or questions from committee members? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, I don't know if Director Sullivan wants to go first or – oh, she – yeah, why don't we let – Director Sullivan, do you want to go f first since you have um, – another board commitment? Well, something I mentioned earlier was perhaps sending out to the community that would be involved in JROTC, the community of those high schools, to see if that was something they wanted. Um, I'm not sure if that's possible, but that sounded like, because there's so, it seems like there's so many people who are against it. And if you do have to have a certain number of people, um, you know, we're hearing lots of different things about how well-funded it is. I, I just think that's something we should have if we're going to do this program. I appreciate you raising that. You raised that issue um, last meeting, and I, I know we had um, some conversations after the meeting about that. And I'm wondering, uh, Ms. Large, do we have somebody here from um, high school? Because um, in my experience as a PPS parent and as a my 11th year in the board, I don't recall a time that we've ever surveyed the community about a particular class. I do know that within, um, as a parent, I have been surveyed about uh, courses that might be offered. And so I'm wondering if we can, um, two things. I know there was a document shared with board members that is um, the PBS course review committee information process and procedures um, that kind of walks through like before we add a course what process the district uses and it's pretty robust and um, we also have um, coming to the dais uh, to, uh, while they're administrators now, um, two individuals who spent a lot of time in high schools. Um, so I think we, maybe you could share um, when something is going to be added, what the process is, how do you gauge like student and family interest, how do you, like, with your budget, if it's something new, how you plan that. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Margaret Calvert. I'm one of the assistant superintendents here uh, in Portland Public Schools, and I work with secondary schools and multiple pathways to graduation. And with me, I have 
Kelly Casty, Senior Director for High School Academics. So there are a couple a couple of spaces, and I, I believe that you receive the documents that show sort of the outline of the process. Um, and there's there's a couple of layers, and I'll invite um, uh, Philippe to, or Dr. Hrish to, <laughs> to, to chime in as well. So a key part of any time that a course is being um, considered or put forward is to gauge interests, right? And so part of what ends up happening is um, you look at what is uh, you when we say survey the community. I think I want to define what the you know like or talk through what that means. So there's a lot of work that happens with um, looking at uh, what are the what is student interest and some and what are some of the pieces that that we get. So principals, vice principals, or a school community, um, you know whether it's uh, you know a specific content area would bring forward an interest in a specific piece. Um, if it were generated by within the school community and then would do um, some initial surveying. Um, I got distracted by uh, Director Sullivan's cat there for a second, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, and then, you know, part of what ends up happening, there's a, there's a number of um, considerations and questions that are outlined in the, uh, the actual course review committee process that then brings that from um, a site base to a, a cross departmental functional team um, at the district level. So I think on page three of the documents, it outlines a series of questions that um, are uh, things that uh, we are considered and that would be brought forth. Um, I know that uh, do, uh, Dr. Hristich, um actually serves on the committee and, and is uh, an active member of that committee as well. But essentially, if it's coming from a student or a school community, you would um, the the committee would the the uh, vice principal or principal would bring something forward that has a lot of questions answered already in some demonstration. Those questions incl include sustainability, interests, what are, would how funding. Things like that are considered as well, but there's a series of questions um, about need, sustainability, student engagement. Um, uh, how does it impact specific groups of students, namely our Black, Brown, and Indigenous students? Is college career alignment? Um, is it standards alignment to um, the grade level, school values, and board goals? So those are the general categories that would come forward from uh, an interest at it from a school site. Is there anything you want to add? The, the only thing that I would add is, um, uh, Ms. Calvert outlined the process um, pretty clearly. Um, in our course catalog, in our district course catalog, the vast majority of courses is in line with a variety of state or federal standards. So when we look at our English courses, our math courses, our science courses, our social studies courses, there's a set of uh, pre-established standards that determine what is the curriculum being taught. We do have some courses that follow a set of standards or follow curriculum that is established by other entities. Our dual credit courses are aligned with our PCC or PSU. Uh, our college partners, our AP courses align with, uh, with the college board uh, curriculum. Our IB courses align with the IB uh, curriculum. Uh, JROTC is in a slightly different category in the sense that there are no state standards, there's no university partner there, it's another entity, right, that determines the curriculum. So that would be an added consideration in this process that we simply haven't had to uh, deal with before and I would just offer as an added layer. Uh, with regards to CTE, uh, I think um, uh, Mr. Breida has outlined some of the questions that we would engage in in considering whether or not JRTC is a, is a good fit, but as has been mentioned, we typically think about are there high interest and high wage jobs that are connected to this pathway uh, of study, but this is consistent with other CTE considerations that we do when we're thinking about should we add the culinary arts CTE program or should we add a computer science program. So we already have an established process for considering those uh, CTE proposals. Okay, um, thank you. I do have to leave. <laughs> uh, continue. <laughs> I know you'd love to talk. <laughs> I really appreciate that, and I think it's worth noting that 
the, um, the, the policy itself actually is sets up parameters and doesn't actually approve the program. Um, so just for um, people who don't have the policy in front of them, the addition is, is just in, consult in consultation with and approval of the superintendent, a high school principal may establish a junior reserve officer training corps program that aligns with PPS academic standards, policies, and administrative directives. Um, so it does, it's not in any way improving the program. It's providing what I look as consider as guardrails. Um, and um, as you've outlined, um, within each school community, there's, um, because I've been in three different high schools, school communities there, well, I've seen, and I've seen a lot, experienced a lot, um, there's different interests by different students. Um, and um, it sounds like there's a mechanism by which if there's, to, get, to gauge student interest and then also to gauge, um, to do this sort of testing against our sort of academic standards and a whole host of other things. And then there's always the, I know you know as principals always the budget. Yeah. Uh, we, we can gauge student interest ahead of time. And there have been times when students are invited to forecast for a course, in other words, to indicate whether or not they're interested in taking the course. And upon seeing that the numbers are simply not there, school decides not to offer the course because not enough students are interested and given our budget restrictions, we're unable to fund courses with only a few students uh, who, are, who are interested. So we gauge student interest during the forecasting process, but I think it's also possible to gauge student interest uh, ahead of time uh, through, through a survey. I guess the other piece just to surface is that what you're hearing and when we're going through the course review process, that this is um, like this is a collaborative multidisciplinary review that happens at, at, uh, at the district with it's with district um, members and also and I'm trying to think of who's on the committee, but they're usually I believe that there are um, uh, school based staff on the committee as well. And so anytime something surfaces, we have a process to vet it and to have the discussion. It may start from a site, but it is vetted across multiple disciplines and multiple, there's other uh, school site members that are part of the committee. Yeah, I, I, I still want to, this is working, I can't hear myself. Oh, go ahead. the time, so go ahead and then. Um, yes, is that me? A um, couple of questions. I, cause, um, by the way, I want to thank everyone who came in and talked in public testimony. I know it's not easy, and especially over such contentious issues, it's very important to hear all these points of views. Um, I, a couple questions. You know, as I as I go over this, I, you know, read this policy over and over again, um, I I kind of worry that we're having like the wrong argument because I want to reiterate your point, uh, Director Brimo, which you're making. Have, approving this policy, um, when I read it. It actually sounds like it might make it harder to implement JROTC because right now um, we don't have a policy on JROTC, right? Like there's there's nothing that says that we can or can't do it right now, right, as is. Am I correct? Right? And by adding this policy, it says that this program has to align with PPS academic standards, policies, and administrative directives. So approving... Am I correct or incorrect or complicated um, in, in that if we vote yes on this policy, that would actually make it harder, that there would be a more rigorous uh, process if JROTC was going to be implemented? Maybe, right. maybe I can answer. I that was also, that was my question as well. Yeah, maybe my, um, I can answer that in that the, it wasn't designed to make it harder or easier. It was designed, which was what policy does, is to provide guidance. And so if you're a high school principal and you have students or families um, or community members who are asking, can you do this, the, the question of it, it's not clear. We don't have any particular guidance. And knowing it's an issue that there's a variety of opinions on, um, this gives guidance on under what conditions and what the criteria is and the quality. And, um, sort of the qualifiers around offering it. Um, so again, I, I, I wouldn't describe it as making it harder and easier, but like really providing guidance and some sideboards um, that I think are pretty pretty standard ones that we would expect that things align with our values and our um, our policies and 
our statutes and our academic standards. Sorry. That was, I had similar questions. It seemed like, and I think you just answered it, that this, the policy as it's drafted would make it more difficult to get a JROTC program in the schools because it had to go through this equity analysis, this board goals analysis, if it, whether it's standards aligned. And, and also, you know, referring back to the New York Times article, um, I think the New York Times article called out where whole schools had to kind of enroll, but I think the policy as it's written does provide guardrails. Um, that seems like it, to me, made it more difficult to to get, to get the program in schools. Yeah, so again, I don't I don't think it makes it more difficult or, or less difficult. What I think is it lays out the process, and it's a process that we'd expect for anything else. Say I had an idea for something that I was passionate about, and it's like, we got to bring this into PPS. Um, that just because I'm passionate about it and I want to bring it, and I think it would provide opportunities if it doesn't, meet these criteria um, and as always with PPS when you sort of click down a layer you find there is a whole system um, which is what I um, think is, you find in that um, very extended document that was sent and there's a whole process around it um, so again I don't think this is applying any particular standards to this program that aren't applied to others it's just being really clear under what conditions and I think removing uncertainty for principles about how they would proceed. Does that answer your question? So just to clarify, just briefly, the uh, course review committee that meets, the pieces that were outlined are things that, that are done regularly in the course committee. So the course re review committee, so when I mentioned standards alignment, school visits, board goals, those things, college and career line, we do that with all courses. So that, that list of questions is the list that we use on a regular basis. Can I ask, do you, is there also a financial analysis? So there's a financial or cost analysis. And then in terms of the demand for jobs, how is that analysis conducted? Are you looking at labor statistics and looking at right. demand for, for jobs, STEM-related specifically? And that's what, our, that's what our CT team does all the time. We're connecting with industry partners, we're reading research, we're looking at job trends um, in the state, across the country, um, and, um, and, and are looking for programs that create pathways for students from high school to post-secondary success. I'll share this year we've probably approved, considered, or revised two, three, dozen courses uh, have involved multiple uh, stakeholders in those decisions, department heads, teachers, um, uh, etc. Those decisions typically don't involve the superintendent. Um, in this case, I would say if such, if a request for a JROTC program came to the committee, even though it doesn't say in the current handbook that the superintendent should be considered, that is probably what we would have done because there are obviously lots of other considerations with regards to this uh, proposal and what we would do is consistent with what's outlined in this policy proposal, which is making sure the superintendent is involved in <laughs> making that decision. Um, yeah. So I just want to summarize really quick. So just in terms of any course being added, you have a rigorous process, it includes aligning with, you know, stuff that's already stated in the policy, aligning with academic standards, policies, and administrative directives. So you already do that. What this would do would add another step, would have to be approved by the superintendent. So if someone were want to approve GR2C right now, before this policy, it would go through all those steps. And then with this policy, they would have to go through all those steps and also get approved by the superintendent. Correct. But just to be clear. wrap up this section. Thank you for thank you for um, for sharing that information. I, I want to give um, Director Green, do you have anything you want to I just want to know how to get this letter 
So I was given an, uh, a letter by a student who um, wanted to remain anonymous out of concern that should they um, go public and share their response that they may not be looked upon favorably upon counselors and possibly miss out on um, some scholarship opportunities. So they asked if I would read the letter um, and refrain from using their name. So I asked them to give me one that didn't actually have their name on it um, because if I'm reading, I'm going to read everything. Um, and then if I hand it over, it's going to have their name on it. So the only way to be anonymous is that they give me one without a name. So they gave me one and it's tagged a concerned student. So I would like to, um, if it's okay with the committee, just read the letter and then have it somehow get just into the public, submitted for the public record. And I want to look at legal to make sure I'm not breaking the law. I always talk to legal. I love legal. <laughs> we love to be loved. Um, I think if you've been asked to read that into the record today, you may do so. Okay. All right. So I, now I, I, I just want to say real quick, I love the love for our legal department. <laughs> All right. So, um, dear school board members, um, PAT, and district staff, um, I am writing to express my strong support for policy allowing principals, excuse me, so if I read it broken, it's, it's written broken. So I don't want to add or put words in. Oh, student voice, okay. I'm writing to express my strong support for the policy allowing principals to allow JROTC program in our schools. I understand there are concerns and hesitations among some teachers and board members regarding this proposal. I respectfully ask you to reconsider and maybe even embrace this as an opportunity for the following reasons. By allowing um, principals to start JROTC, we are expanding the range of educational opportunities available to students. Not every student does good in traditional school subjects, and JROTC can provide an alternative pathway for personal growth and skill development. As I understand, the program offers hands-on learning experiences, which is how I learn. Leadership training and exposure to civic responsibilities, which are invaluable for a well-rounded education and denying students the option to participate in JROTC limits our ability to explore diverse interests and potential career paths. JROTC is also known for instilling discipline, character, and a sense of responsibility in students. The structured environment, emphasis on self-discipline, and mentorship from military personnel contribute significantly to students' personal growth and maturity. These things are not only beneficial during our school years, but also lay a strong foundation for success in higher education and future careers. By supporting the establishment of JRTC, we are investing in the character development of our student body. Another advantage of JROTC is the emphasis on leadership development. The program equips students with essential, um, essential leadership skills, including effective communication, decision making, teamwork, and problem solving. These skills can be applied in various domains of life, from academic endeavors to professional pursuits. JROTC also offers leadership roles and responsibilities that empower students to take on meaningful challenges and become confident leaders within our school community. It is crucial to recognize that not allowing even the consideration of GROTC takes away options from students who may benefit a lot from such a program. Every student deserves access to a diverse range of educational experiences that cater to their unique interests and strengths by embracing the policy to allow principals to start JROTC, we are fostering an inclusive and enriching environment for all students. Thank you for considering the perspectives of students like myself, and I hope for your support in bringing JROTC to our school community. Sincerely, a concerned student. And then who do I give this to? Just pass it out to 
Bradshaw, and she will uh, post it with public comment. Um, thank you, um, Director Green. So um, I'm going to shift now to the district-wide advocacy and fundraising policy, and I have posted an amendment um, that I'm proposing. It's on the second page of the, of the policy, and it is the last lines, the line, or not the last line, yes, it, yes, it is the last line. The board, and it's, it's I'm proposing striking the, the sentence that said, the board members will be approved by the PPS Board of Education. And I'm striking that um, primarily because, um, first of all, it's not essential for us to make the shift from individual schools foundations um, to a district-wide foundation being sort of our, pla our platform for fundraising. Um, second, I've had a number of discussions after the last meeting, and I don't, I don't think it's necessary. I also would like um, just to share that um, in addition to the other public comment that's been posted, that the fund for PPS, which is a district-wide foundation, um, and the district-wide foundation that has supported our strategic plan, um, has submitted a, le um, a letter to the school board, um, and also um, in a conversation with them, um, uh, we have agreed to post it um, as part of public, the public comment. And as part of that letter, um, which points out to the um, services and the supports they've provided to PPS students, families, and schools, from launching the Crisis Relief Fund to supporting arts education, environmental sustainability initiatives, championing the Master of Art Education Plan, um, that as they look to their future and um, in discussions with um, this board and the larger school community about district-wide foundation, um, that they um, plan to expand their board of directors, and I'll just quote from the letter that we plan to ex expand our board of directors and collaborate with the PPS Parent Advisory Committee to steward philanthropic funds raised through this new model. As elected representative of our community, you, the board, possess the insight necessary to help us identify new board members who can join us in guiding the fund for PPS as an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, so um, I would like to add that, and I would like to add the striking of it, um, or amend we, the we policy. Yes, sentence. thank you. I don't need to do double negative. Um, is there any committee discussion about removing that? No, I think it makes it easier. I, I also see it as an opportunity to, you know, um, have more voices in the choosing of that board, so yes, I'm, I'm in favor. You can have an opinion. I, I didn't know I could talk. I'm not really on the committee, so I, but no. Um. Wait, you're not? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, so generally how we, um, it's, it's everybody in favor of um, striking that sentence? Yes. yes. Um, I would also ask, um, so I, I agree as well, so we'll post the revised version. Um, also, given that it's not a substantial change to the policy, um, it shouldn't require a, um, another first reading of the policy. And I um, just want to make sure that um, as a committee we agree with that and send it back. Yes. Okay. It'll, yes. it'll be still on the docket. Um, for, at the with board. that amendment. Board. Yes. Okay. Um, is there any other discussion about um, the foundation policy? I, I do want to share that if you go for the, because there's been a lot of questions about, um, there, we don't have a district-wide foundation. We do, we do have a district-wide foundation, the Fund for PPS. Um, and if you go to their website, you can see um, what their focus areas have, have been, who's currently on their board. Um, and the work they've done um, over the last, uh, since 2019, since it was formed, that have supported um, district-wide initiatives at, at PPS. Would they be, um, as they're building their board, will they be able to share their process so that we can get broad representation from people that would be interested in, in 
Well, I think it says right here. Being on the board. Um, you can, you have insights um, as representatives of the community through the board um, to help us identify new board members. So I think they'll be interested in that, and I'm, I'm sure they're happy to share the, whatever their, their process is um, Great. as well. I also want to um, note that posted along with the, commi the committee materials is um, a conceptual draft of a um, sort of more supercharged ab advocacy and fundraising plan. I want to thank um, Chair Hollins for uh, providing a, a sort of a first draft and sort of getting us going that we spend the next um, several months um, in partnership um, after if, after the policy is passed, we spend the, the time in partnership with um, the fund for, for PPS and the broader community in terms of looking at how we expand our reach. And we have, I think, a really uh, great uh, potential target with the upcoming long legislative session um, and bringing the community together um, and all of our stakeholders. Anything on your end? Okay. All right. Um, then I'm just going to go to the last item that um, the diploma policy, which is um, <laughs> seems to be the easiest item on our agenda. Um, we didn't have any public comments. I'm wondering if there's any board discussion or questions to follow up on on that. I know Director Wong, your committee, the Student Success Committee, will be looking at other things to, for further evolution. I don't have any questions. Yeah, at some point we're going to look at it again, but I think all this stuff makes sense and it did with state laws. Oops. I'm, uh, great. Thank you. I'm just noticing, uh, Chair Hollins, you have your, your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. We can. Okay. I just wanted to talk about a little bit about the foundation piece. Um, and it, it's more of a plea, I would say. You know, um, I understand that a lot of people have a lot of different um, opinions about, one, how this came about, um, their opinions about if it should be reworked. Um, people talk about the equity piece. They talk about, you know, our funding right now where we have a $30 million deficit. And I, and I understand all this issues. My plea right now is that we have to move forward at this point. Um, we have to try to get everyone involved because we have bigger issues at this point, which is a $75 million budget shortfall that we're going to have to address. And my hope is and prayer is that everyone come together with this foundation, with this different foundation piece as it is, because it, it is what it is. We're, we're here. Because if we don't, and we have to have a $75 million deficit that we have to cover, and I'm not, I don't want to minimize the amount of money that people are raising, because it is, it is a significant amount. But it won't be that significant if we have to cut $75 million. You worried about, you know, we worried about a half of a teacher here or, or a, a TA here. We're going to be talking about hundreds and hundreds of teachers. And so while I know that the, how it became about, people feel a certain way about how it, how it came about, we really going to have to get together and come together to figure out how do we do this, not just the foundation pieces, but how do we also advocate um, for our kids? Because this year, we think it's rough. It's going to be twice as rough if we don't come together. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you. I want to. I just want to appreciate um, Director Hollins um, for saying that and talking about unity, which I've also heard a lot about in the last uh, few days, actually, about the need for us to come together. And to that end, perhaps the people that feel that they have not been heard, would, this would be a great opportunity to to get involved, to to keep. You know, it's there's opportunities for all of us, parents, teachers. Um, students to get involved um, at the state at the state level to ask for funding and that's something that we all have in common is that we we all care about our schools we care about our, our 
communities, um, not building by building, but by our entire our entire community. We, we have a goal of supporting this community. All of us have that same goal. So let's, let's pull together and do this. We're going to need all hands on deck. I think we're going to let um, Chair Hollins and Director DePass have the final words. Thank you. The unity message. Um, so our meeting is adjourned.